Yeah? Everyone good? All right. OK, so uh, my name is Amal Ahmed. Um, I'm going to be talking about logical relations this week. So um, I know we're in the second week. Hope you guys have been having a good first week. <laughs> Uh, all right, so let's uh, kind of get into it. Um, so what are logical relations? Um, basically, it's a, it's a proof method for establishing a really wide variety of properties. And my goal this week is to give you a sense of you know, um, the basic techniques that go into this proof method, what kinds of things it's useful for, um, what kinds of um, tricks you need to use in order to scale this proof method to prove meta-theoretic kinds of properties of languages that you know, are, can be like, extremely expressive in terms of the features that you can handle, rich type systems and so on. OK, so um, let me just start by saying a few words. So OK, so as I already said, uh, logical relations are a proof method that are useful for establishing a wide variety of properties of languages and so on. So let's just start by talking about what kinds of properties. So one of the classic proofs using logical relations that many of you or some of you may have already seen is a proof of something called strong normalization. The fact that all evaluations um, of a well-typed program terminate. So for the simply typed lambda calculus, for example, that's the case. Um, any well-typed program will, when you run it, it will always terminate, whether, regardless of whether you use a call by name or a call by value evaluation strategy. And that's a proof that is normally done using this technique. So properties like termination. But you can also use logical relations to prove properties like type safety. Does that come as a surprise to people? Or how many people think type safety and think progress and preservation? I mean, I'm sure everyone does, but don't think, <laughs> feel like, wait, why logical relations? Yes? OK. <laughs> all right, so one of my goals um, is to show you that you know, progress and preservation is not the only way of proving type safety. Um, and we'll get into that uh, in tomorrow's lecture. So type safety. All right. Um, and in particular, just to, to give you a little bit of a sense, today I'll talk about termination. Tomorrow I'll start talking about type safety. Um, today I'll work with the simply type lambda calculus. Tomorrow I'll, I'll extend that to a language that, um, in which not all programs terminate. Um, OK, but what else? Um, equivalence of programs. So logical relations are incredibly useful for reasoning about when two programs might be equivalent. So why would you care about proving that two programs are equivalent? Yes? Optimization. optimization, exactly. If you're doing compiler optimizations, you definitely want to know that if you took an original program and optimized it, transformed it to something else, you want to know that the two are equivalent. Only then is your optimization correct, right? Um, so correctness of optimizations. Um, or even suppose, so here I sort of said, OK, an optimization. I'm kind of assuming that your compiler is doing um, a transformation within the same intermediate language of the compiler, perhaps, right? Same language, I'm just optimizing it to another program in the same language. But compilers also do uh, transformations from one intermediate language into a lower intermediate language, right? And logical relations can be incredibly useful for proving that those transformations are correct as well. And now here I'm making this distinction because those transformations have to relate two programs in two different languages. And you can use a logical relation in order to do that. Um, OK, so correctness of optimizations and in general transformations. What else? Suppose that you have two different implementations of some sort of abstract data type. Like, let's say you have a stack interface, classic example, um, and you implemented uh, your stack using an array, and then you implemented it to, uh, after that using a linked list. And you want to show that both of these implementations are equivalent. They both provide um, implementations of a push method and a pop method, create a new stack method, right? Um, how do you show that those two implementations are equivalent? Now, this is a classic uh, property known as representation independence. If I give you a stack interface, and I, behind that interface, I hide what the concrete implementation of the stack looks like. That's where my example is coming from, right? In one case, I said you implemented your, your concrete implementation of the stack, uses an array. In the other case, it uses a linked list. And you want to be able to prove that both of these implementations are equivalent, and that your clients, the clients of this abstract data type, or the clients of this module, will never be able to tell this difference between those two implementations, because they can't look at your concrete implementation. So this property. 
um, the fact that the clients can't look at the concrete implementation is known as representation independence. And you know, as you can tell by what I just said, right? It's an equivalence kind of property. You want to show that those two implementations of the stack are equivalent. Okay. Um, also, parametricity. Um, how many people know what parametricity is? I'm trying to get a sense of my audience for the rest of the week. Okay, that's good. All right, that gives me a good sense. Okay, so parametricity is a property that we get in languages that support uh, polymorphism. Um, and we'll talk more about this later in the week. Uh, but parametricity basically says that if, um, so suppose that I have um, an expression and it has some sort of type. I'm a function, let me write it as f. Suppose that I have a function, it has type for all alpha, alpha or alpha or alpha, all right? This is a function that says, give me any type whatsoever. I'm calling it alpha right now. But you know, you, I can give this function a Boolean type, for instance. And then if I give it a Boolean value, it'll give me something back, right? It's just a function type. But in particular, um, having alpha here mean that um, this function is promising you that it will never look inside the value that you pass it as an argument. It will treat it opaquely at all times. And that's a really rich property. Uh, so we'll talk about that. Um, uh, so, and, and as a consequence of parametricity, you get certain theorems. So because this function promises never to inspect its argument, never inspect the value that you pass it right there, What do you think we're going to get back from the function? Right, so assuming that this function terminates, the only thing it can ever give you back is the thing that you passed into it because it's promising to give you back an alpha. And it can't create alphas because I might have chosen to instantiate my alpha, right? So the way this works is I'm going to take f and you know, apply it to bool and then pass in true, for example. Or I could pass in false, but I could also do f instantiate that alpha type with int and pass in five, right? In either case, in the first case, f has to give me back true, because it can't generate any other alpha you know, um, value, because it doesn't know what alpha is, OK? So it has to give you back the thing that you passed in. There's no other way for it to generate an alpha, OK? Um, another consequence of that might be, what if I have that? What will that function give me back? <laughs> right, that function can never exist. You will not be able, we'll get into this, but you will not be able to write such a function because this function is promising, or the type is promising. Um, if you give me an integer, I'll give you back an alpha. But how is it going to give me back an alpha? Suppose I decided to take f and apply it to bool and 3. Um, and then, or, or otherwise take f, instantiate the alpha with int, and then apply it to four. I mean, in either case, in this case, how is it going to generate an alpha? In this case, how is it going to generate an alpha? It doesn't know what the type is, because we keep changing the type on it. It promises to treat the type opaquely, and therefore it can't give you back something that you never passed in. Yes? May we ask questions? Yes, yes absolutely. I would love for you to ask questions. Uh, yes, so I am doing my type application right here, yes. and I am specifying what alpha is, but I am assuming that in this language you do not have the ability to write down, as part of the program text, check if the type is equal to this, then do that. So that is called ad hoc polymorphism, where you are able to take a type and actually inspect um, what, you know, what that type is and then sort of respond accordingly. You're inspecting the type in the, in the program. Here I'm assuming that you, you can't do that. Okay. OK, yes? Would that help, though, to be able to, I mean, you could only have a finite number of pages, so if you would use better methods. Yes, there are definitely, um, I'm not going to get into that, but yes, there, there are languages designed according to that principle, and that's a very useful feature. Uh, having any sort of intentional type analysis is what it's called, right? Being able to inspect your types and then change the behavior of your program accordingly can be extremely useful. Okay? All right, for, for this program, I was assuming I do not have that feature in my language. All right, so. Um, Things like this, the fact that there can be no f that has this type, right? Um, or things like um, my earlier 
type, when I have for all alpha, 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 the fact that this function must always behave like the identity function. It will always give you back what you pass, the argument that you passed it, assuming it terminates. Um, these are called free theorems. These are instances of free theorems. Um, and they follow as a consequence of parametricity. We'll talk about, uh, we'll go through the proof of one or two free theorems um, around lecture three. Okay, uh, so parametricity and free theorems. And for those of you who haven't uh, read about free theorems, um, theorems for free is sort of the, by Phil Wadler's, the classic reference, classic paper on this um, that shows you all the nice properties you get as a consequence of parametricity. Okay, um, what else? Um, you can also use, so again, uh, so here I was talking about equivalence of programs. Um, let's change gears a little bit. Um, how about um, in security type languages? People know what security type languages are. All right. Um, so there's a wide range, there's been a lot of work on languages that um, have type systems that keep, uh, that basically provide information flow control. All right, so let me sort of, for those of you who may not know, just sort of security type languages for information flow control. So just to give you a sense of what that might mean, in these languages you have the ability to essentially declare a type, uh, sorry, declare a variable. Uh, so x is an integer, but I'm going to say that this is a low security integer. All right, um, y is an integer, but I'm going to make it a high security in integer. All right, so in this language I'm assuming that I can annotate um, my <laughs> my types with levels indicating whether something should be kept confidential or whether something is low security and can be leaked out to the world, so to speak. Okay? So in languages like this, the type system is designed to catch any um, information leaks, like any flow of high security information into a low security variable. All right? So for example, that would mean that if I write x equals y, take y and put it in the variable x, that's an explicit information leak, right? I'm taking a high data value and storing it in the low security variable. So the type system should catch this and say, no, sorry, that does not type check, All right? So the type system is designed to catch um, information leakage in that way. Okay, so, so this would be an error. This is, this is what we call an explicit flow of information, right? High security thing being put in a low security thing. Um, but you can also have things like if y greater than zero, then uh, let's make x equal to 1, else let's make x equal to 0. Could that program type check? No. Okay, why not? There's a type channel. There's a type channel. All right, what does that mean? Okay, it means, um, why is a high security piece of data, right? It's a high security integer. I don't want it influencing low security variables. That's the idea. That's what the type system is supposed to give me. But here, I'm checking if y is greater than 0 and then changing the value x based on that. Now, admittedly, I'm not learning everything about y. All I'm learning about it is, is it positive or not, right? But that is a flow of some information from the variable y, which is high security, into the variable x, which is low security, all right? So security type languages, the type system has to be able to you know, flag such errors. So this, this is what we call an implicit flow. And such languages will not allow a program like this to type check. Okay, so what is my point about languages for information flow security? Um, so if I design a security type language and I tell you that this language promises you, uh, gives you confidentiality guarantees. In other words, any program that um, leaks information will not type check. Then I have to prove that, don't I? I have to prove that that type of system actually does that. So how would we state the theorem that this type system guarantees confidentiality. Let's think about that. Basically what we're trying to say is suppose, right, we have to step back a little from individual programs and say what's the meta-theoretic property that I want for, um, you know, from this language? What I want is the ability to say that if any program P type checks, suppose that some program P type checks. It's well typed, the type system set gave, gave it the go-ahead, it's okay. All right, I want to be able to prove that when I run this program, actually let's make, make that tau a little more concrete. Um, suppose that the program takes some number of low security inputs and some number of uh, high security inputs, okay? And just to keep things simple, I'll say that this uh, takes 
one low security input, one high security input, and gives me a low security output. Okay? I want to be able to know that this program does not allow this input to leak to the output, right? Okay. How am I going to say that? Exactly. I do. I want to say that uh, the the low security output does not depend upon the high security input, right? So, roughly speaking, the the property that I need to be able to prove is that if I ran uh, p twice, but I ran it with the um, with the same low security inputs but different high security inputs. So here I'm going to use v low and v h one. And here I'm going to use V low, same, same value for the low input, but a different high security input. I, want to, I need to be able to prove that I always get the same, this means the same low security output. The outputs of these two programs, which are going to be a low integer, have to be equal. All right? Of course, that's not the formal statement of the theorem, but that is roughly the shape of the theorem that we want to be able to prove. And theorems of that form are called non-interference theorems. Right, they're all about the fact that low security outputs should never depend on high security inputs. Okay? And again, you can see that this is a property that me, in, in order to state it, I had to say something about two runs of the same program, but with different high inputs. Right? So again, this is a property which is about equivalence of programs. It's stated in a slightly different way, but it's about equivalence of programs. So it kind of falls into this category of program proofs, and logical relations have been used to prove properties like non-interference for security type languages like that. So let me just say non-interference. OK, I won't be talking about non-interference, but that was just to give you a slight sense of the kinds of things that, you know, major categories of things that um, logical relations are used for. Um, yes, let me take a question. Um, so uh, Andrew Meyer's group, for many years now, has been working on a language called GIF, Java with Information Flow Security. That's a practical um, language, and it's been a, a research language that's been extended over the years with many features. I mean, so, GIF. Okay, um, and there are others. Um, all right, so let's see. So here's how I'd like to proceed. Um, so what I'd like to do is... Um, because I want to give you a sense of how logical relations are defined in general, actually, let me start by sort of categorizing them into, into two groups. All right? Logical relations can be, which part should I use? Let's go here. I'd like us to start viewing logical relations as uh, kind of of two kinds. There are logical predicates, which are essentially a unary relation, hence the word predicate. These are unary. And there are binary logical relations. And they have lots of similarities and some differences. So generally, we use logical predicates when we want to talk about um, some, pro some single program having a certain property. But we use logical relations, the binary version, when we want to talk about two programs being somehow related, right? And now, as soon as I say that, oh, actually, so let me try to write that down. So basically, here we're interested in, say, in defining some sort of a set or a predicate, which says that all expressions E of some type tau satisfy some property of interest as specified by that P, all right? And I'll make this more concrete in a second. Whereas the binary logical relations are about defining some sort of a relation R that says some programs E1 and E2 are somehow related. They could be equivalent. They could be, you know, um, they, one could be an approximation of another in a certain way, um, different notions of relatedness. And here we'll again assume that E1 and E2 are true programs of type tau, and they are related in this relation R, all right? That's the sort of, this, this P and R are supposed to give you a sense of the overall structure of the kind of relation that we define in order to establish some property, all right? So before we go on, Termination. All well-typed programs will terminate. Is that a unary property or a binary one? Unary, unary right? Because I'm saying, give me a program, and I will prove to you that it will terminate. 
Type safety. What does type safety say? Type safety says, if my program is well typed, then when I run it, it will not get stuck. Unary, binary. Unary. Unary. Okay. Equivalence of programs, two programs, obviously binary. All of these properties are binary, non-interference is binary. All right? Okay. So, um, with that in mind, um, let's kind of jump in and start talking about how we might define these kinds of things. So as I said already, today what I want to talk about is this property of the simply typed lambda calculus called strong normalization. Basically it says that um, evaluation of a well-typed term will always terminate. Okay? Um, and it's a unary property, and we'll set up a logical predicate or a unary logical relation, just trying to introduce you to different ways of referring to these things, um, in order to establish strong normalization for simply type lambda calculus. Um, and again, you know, as I said, tomorrow we'll look at type safety, which is also this unary property, and then we'll start talking about parametricity, representation, independence, and so on. Uh, all right. So, let's do that. Okay. Um, so, just as a warm up, <laughs> I know all of you are completely familiar with the simply typed lambda calculus, but I want you to, I want us to be on the same page with respect to what kind of notation I'm using. All right? So, that's why I have this up. This is my simply typed lambda calculus. Uh, my types are Booleans and functions. I have, uh, you know, the standard expressions in the language true, false, if, then, else, lambda, and application. This is a call by value language that I'm going to work with today. All right? So the operational semantics shows you that. Um, so my value forms are true, false, lambda, as you'd expect. Um, I use a Felizon style you know, um, evaluation context to write, specify my operational semantics. And so you can tell you know, here, um, I must evaluate in the function position, but this uh, construct says that I must also evaluate in the argument position, which means that this is a call by value language. Right? OK. And then I define my um, reduction rules here. So if I hit if true, then you know it's if true, then e1, if false, then e2, and so on. Um, and this is of course our beta reduction rule, right? So lambda applied to a value reduces to e with v for x, all right? And I'm using that notation for substitution. Okay, all right. Um, and now of course these are my reduction rules, so I have to lift them up to you know bigger programs by adding a rule for that sort of lifts that up to evaluation. Context. Okay, good. Um, and there's the type system. Again, I, I'm sure you have seen this. Um, let me just mention one convention. So, um, of course, this says E has type tau under gamma. And the convention I'm using for gamma is that when I write a comma here, I am going to be assuming that X does not appear in the domain of this gamma. All right? So all my commas are going to mean disjointness of the domain. Um, all right, and uh, that's about it. Everything else is utterly standard, for, as you'd expect for the simply type lambda calculus. But it helps to have these rules up there because we're going to be doing proofs with them. Okay? All right. So, uh, what property do we want to prove? Strong normalization. Um, so, what does strong normalization say? Let me push this up and bring the other board down. Okay, so strong normalization says that if um, if I have a closed program E of type tau, then that E must terminate. Oh, let me define some abbreviations actually before we go on. Um, so I'm going to write um, E evaluates to V. That's going to be my shorthand for, you know, take a whole bunch of small steps, uh, small steps using our operational semantics, and E reduces to V, you know, steps to V in some number of steps, then I write that E terminates and gives us back V. And when I write E just down arrow as an E terminates, 
uh, then that's just shorthand for there exists a V such that V evaluates to V. Okay? All right. Um, so that's what I'm using here. If E is well typed, then it terminates. There exists a value V such that it E evaluates to V. Um, so that's what we want to prove. Now, how might we prove it? Let's not use a logical relation to start with. All right, suppose that you had to prove this property. That's the theorem, I'm asking you to prove it. So, you have a theorem. You have the language about which you want to prove the theorem. Induction on? On the structure of the, okay, so induction on the structure of the expression is a valid answer. Another valid answer is? Yes? Uh, evaluation not exactly. I, I was thinking just induction on this derivation, which which is just. Sorry, that's what I was ah, okay, okay, all right. Induction on this on this typing derivation, yeah. right? This is a typing derivation. We could just do induction on the typing derivation. If you think about it for a second, the two are going to amount to the same thing. Induction on the structure of the term. Induction on the structure of the derivation, right? Okay. Um, so let's try to do that. Uh, let's try to do it with with derivations, just because it makes things a little easier to spot. Um, I want to prove this. So we're going to do uh, induction on the structure of the derivation. What are the cases I have to consider? What's the first easiest case? Right, we're going to do, sorry, say that again? I didn't hear that. Use? E is a value. E is a value. Oh, E is a value. Actually, I, um, so if we're doing induction on the structure of the derivation, we want to consider every single typing rule, right? Because we're doing induction on the structure of the typing derivation. So that means we have cases that correspond to every single one of those typing rules that are up on the board. All right? What's the first one? Variables. Case. Should I consider this case? Well, you get an empty context. I've got an empty context. So that one doesn't even apply. I don't need to do a case for that, right? Because that's a free variable. And, and here my theorem, clear, my theorem premise clearly says that E is closed. OK, I'm not going to consider that one. Good. Um, so what's my simplest other case? True, right? Is true terminating? Yeah. Good, it's already a value, so we're fine. How about false? Next case, false. Yeah. Same thing, all right. How about if then else? Just look at the rule up there, I won't write it out. Now we're doing the if then else rule. If E, then E1, else E2, right? We're doing induction on the structure of the typing derivation. So our, we have three induction hypotheses, or three things that we get from the, by applying the induction hypothesis. We know that E, it's if E, then E1, else E2. We know that E terminates, we know that E1 terminates, and we know that E2 terminates. And now we need to show that if E, then E1, else E2 terminates. Yeah? That should go through. Should be fairly easy, right? We're just sort of, um, we'll, we'll get the answer we want using our induction hypothesis. All right, now let's talk about lambda. The lambda case, where we have, I shouldn't have put a gamma there, <laughs> this should be empty, um, where we have lambda x colon tau dot e. How does that proceed? Good point. If you want, we can do it. Okay, so the if case, um, I said E, E1, and E2, all three of those terminate, right? But then we have to put those facts together to show that, so we know E terminates and gives us some V, E1 terminates and gives us some V1, E2 terminates, gives us some V2, and now we have to show that if E then E1 else E2 terminates, we can inspect the operational semantics. We know that we're going to evaluate here first, and so in some number of steps, we're going to end up getting to if V, then E1 else E2, right? And now what Adam just pointed out. We have to think about the fact, what is this value, right? Since the program is well typed, we know that this value, because we know that this value has a Boolean type, we know that it must be either true or false. So now we have two cases to consider. In the first case, this whole thing is going to step to E1, and we know that E1 terminates, so we're done. In the second case, we know that it's going to step to E2, E2 terminates, so we're done, right? So there is that one little property you need about uh, the fact that E is a Boolean, therefore V must be a Boolean, and therefore it's true or false. Okay, so let's come back. 
Um, how about lambda? It's a value already. Good, that was easy. Just like true and false. All right. How about application? What do we have? Sorry, writing the premises at the bottom. <laughs> E2 um, cal. So we know that E1, which has this function type, we know that E1 terminates by our induction hypothesis, right? Um, by applying our induction hypothesis to our second premise, we know that E2 terminates, right? Okay. E1 terminates with V1, E2 terminates with V2. All right. We have to show that E1, E2 terminates. Let's do what we just did um, at Adam's, su Adam's suggestion before, right? Just like with Booleans, we had that E that evaluated to a V. We knew the E was a Boolean, so we knew the value that it gave us back had to be true or false. We can do a similar sort of reasoning and say, hey, this E1 right here, it's a function. Since it's a function, the V1 that we get over here must be a lambda, all right? So I'm going to do that little bit of reasoning and basically say that, yes, this has to be a lambda. Okay, so that means that in order to show that E1, E2 terminates, I have to, I now know that E1 applied to E2 in some number of steps gives me lambda x colon tau dot E prime, um, let's say still applied to E2, it takes some more number of steps. Is this too low? Is it, can the guys, can everyone see? Okay. Um, Yes, sorry, thank you. Two there. Okay, so E1, E2 evaluates to some lambda E2, and then with some more steps, we get to lambda x E prime applied to V2. And now we have to show that that expression terminates. Right, that's our remaining proof obligation. How are we going to proceed? How many people know how we're going to proceed? Adam does, Bob does. <laughs> okay, we can beta reduce it, yes. So we certainly, as part of showing that, we can certainly take one more step, and now we get E prime with V2 for X. And I'm going to shift our proof obligation. Now we have to show that terminates. What's missing? Why can't we make progress? Definition of substitution. Definition of substitution. Mm. You have no knowledge about E prime, right? It's not the definition of substitution. It's the fact that all we knew about our lambda is that it terminates, but that wasn't, that was fine because it's already a value, so we didn't care. But the thing is, the lambda is a suspension. It has some code underneath it, right? This lambda ha has a computation suspended underneath it. And at some point, we're going to run into the situation where we need to run that computation that's hiding under the lambda. And the application case is exactly where that happens, right? We apply um, E1 to E2, we end up having to apply the function to some argument. And now suddenly our computation is out there at the top level and we need to know something about it. We need to know that this computation, when we give it some argument, is going to terminate. And we can't do that. We, the way that we're carrying out this proof, we just don't have, a, uh, have an induction hypothesis strong enough to be able to say that the body of the lambda has the property that we are interested in, the strong normalization property. All right? And what I just said is the key to where logical relations come in. Right? In order to establish strong normalization, we need a stronger induction hypothesis. And the defining feature of logical relations is, kicks in usually with function. It allows you to say that the body of the function has a property of interest, and that then gives you a strong enough induction hypothesis to allow you to make progress. All right? 
So let's see how we do that. OK, so this is our failed proof strategy. It's very important to see what proofs fail <laughs> before you see why you need correlation. All right, so back to the theorem we wanted to establish. So now I'm going to use a unary logical relation to specify my property of interest, which is that all well-typed terms terminate. All right, I'm going to call, so there I was writing uh, P, it's hidden. Um, before I was writing some predicate which says that E, some, some expression E has type tau and belongs to the set P, is how you should read that. I'm gonna define the set SN for strongly normalizing terms. And when I write SN E, and I have a subscript tau here, the way I want you to think of this is E is some expression of type tau that is strongly normalizing. That's, as in, we're going to define this predicate to give us what I just said, all right? Okay, so let's look at how we would do that. So before I start defining this set or this predicate for, you know, for strong normalization, um, I wanna tell you a little bit about um, sort of the general principle of how we go about doing this, right? Um, so in general, if we are trying to specify some logical predicate P, and P here just means you have some property that you are interested in proving about expressions, about typed expressions in this language. Then you set up the predicate, um, generally speaking, um, in a certain way. You, you define it so that it has certain properties. Um, first you say that, um, any that all expressions in that set must be well typed, okay? So if, is, if E, of type tau is in P, so we're gonna say that um, E has type tau. I can write it as E has, let me write it in a more brief way. We wanna make sure that when we define the relation, the definition says that E has type tau, okay? And notice that E is a closed expression. I'm not putting open expressions into this, this set. All right, uh, second, uh, we need a condition Second, we're going to specify, we're going to define the predicate so that it says that this expression has the property of interest, okay? Condition we want to prove. So E has property of interest. There, we're going to define S and E to say that E terminates, okay? Third, and this is the weird one. It's the one that we sometimes use and sometimes don't. Um, we want to, when we define uh, P, we want to make sure that it requires, um, that the condition of interest or the property of interest is preserved by elimination forms for, for type tau, okay? So for now I'll just write, I'll explain what that means in a second. Condition is preserved by evaluation of elimination forms. Let me pause for a second. Is everyone familiar with the terminology introduction forms and elimination forms? Yes? Okay, for anyone who might not be, let me just quickly talk about it. So for every type that we have in our language, and this language only has two types, it has Booleans and it has functions, the introduction form for Booleans are given by those two typing rules that introduce true and false, right? The conclusion of the rules has something has type bool. If then else is the elimination form, that's how you use a Boolean. In the case of functions, lambda is the introduction form, it's how you introduce a function. And application is the elimination form, it's how you use a function, okay? So introduction means introduce, and, <laughs> and elimination means how you use something of that type, okay? So um, this is about adding something to your definition of the relation that says that you're, the property you're interested in is preserved by elimination forms. Okay, and we'll come back to that. Um, elimination forms for type tau, I should say, right? Because we have a tau indexing this predicate. All right, so let's um, try to make that more concrete. Let's define this um, S N tau E relation, all right? Yes. Oh, that, I smudged it because it's just a colon. It just says E colon tau. Okay, okay. So, uh, yes. So we're going to, uh, 
define this relation. We're going to define it by induction on the, on the structure of types, of this type tau. Okay? So how many cases are we going to have in our definition of this set? How many types do we have? Two. Two. Okay. So the first one's going to be for Booleans. So what I want to define is when is it the case that some E is strongly normalizing at type bool? So let's look at the property. First thing we want to say is E should be a Boolean, right? Second thing we want to say is E has the property of interest. E terminates. Third thing we want to say is this thing about elimination form. Uh, actually, for Booleans, we won't need it. This is, this is going to be good enough. All right? And we'll come back to why. Condition three is a bit mysterious. But it's really kind of where the major power of logical relations come in. This is the thing that's going to help us strengthen our induction hypothesis so that exactly where our proof failed before, right, it's going to go through. Okay? So that's the magic we'll get into. All right. Uh, the next case is going to be for our function type. So now what, what are we trying to define? We're trying to say when does an expression E uh, belong to the strongly normalizing set of the type tau and our tau 2? Well, E has to have the right type. So E has to be type tau and our tau 2. Um, second, E has the property of interest. E has to therefore terminate. That's our property of interest. And this time, we're actually going to do something with property three. E has to be preserved by elimination forms for that type. What is the elimination form for the type tau and our tau two? Application. Application. OK, so here's the condition we want to add. We want to say um, that when you take this E, which has a function type, and you apply it to some argument, then that application is going to be strongly normalizing. OK? That's what we want to say. But there's a little bit of a, a, of a subtlety. What we really want to say is that for any e prime of, for any e prime that already has the property of interest, but it is an argument, so it is of type tau 1, give me an argument, e prime, that already has the property of interest and has the right type. Then the application of E to E prime will be strongly normalizing at the result type tau 2. So this is all my third condition. OK? And that's the thing that says um, when you do an application, you're going to get something that is strongly normalizing. But notice that you only get some, the application is only strongly normalizing if you give me an argument that's strongly normalizing. Right? That's, kind of, that's key here. OK. Um, so that's just um, the definition of the logical relation. But now this definition is supposed to help us do certain things. OK, so once we've defined our logical relation, in this case our unary logical relation, um, here's how we generally want to proceed. Um, we want to show that if something is well-typed, then it belongs to the logical relation. All right. If uh, let me write it as an implication rather. is well typed, then it belongs to the logical relation that we have just defined at the type tau. Right? We're the ones who made up this logical relation, right? So yeah. Um, the second thing that we will then want to prove is that if you have an expression that is in our logic that belongs to our logical relation at the appropriate type, then it has a property of interest. E terminates. Okay? So our proofs will almost always be structured in this fashion. 
What we really wanted at the top level is that theorem at the very top. If E has type tau, then E terminates. The way we're proving it is in two steps. If E has type tau, then it's in our relation, and if it's in our relation, then it has the property we want. We're breaking the proof up into two parts. Right? And all of this has to do with like how a Sn tau is a relation that's allowing us to beef up our induction hypothesis so that the proof actually goes through. All right, so um, let's prove B first. If some expression is in the relation that we've just defined, we want to show that it terminates. How do you do the proof? By induction on. Exactly, the second property right here. OK, so let's be a little more formal. Let's step back for a second. So we can prove B uh, by induction on the type tau. Right? We can prove this by induction on the type tau. There are two cases. In the case of Booleans, look at the second property. It terminates. In the case of functions, look at the second property. It terminates. So what did we do? We built a relation so that it already says that E has to have that property. Okay? So by definition, we've, we've constructed a relation that allows us to prove this trivially, immediately. Okay? All right. So the proof is by induction on tau, but it's immediate from the definitions of uh, Sn. All right, so that means the hard case is part A. And it's true, the hard case is part A. <laughs> All right, so how do we proceed with part A? Um, all right. Oh, before I go on, um, notice that there's something important to point out here. I said that we were defining this logical relation by induction on uh, the structure of the types, right? So by induction on tau. So when you write down one of these, it's important to inspect it and make sure that the definition that you have just put down is well-founded, all right? So what does that mean? Well, if we just inspect it, um, here we're trying to define a set Sn indexed by Boole, and notice the definition doesn't use Sn at all, so we're good. Uh, here we're defining to, to de trying to define um, Sn for tau and our tau 2. The definition does use Sn but at a smaller type. Tau 1 is a smaller type than tau 1 hour tau 2. And here it uses Sn again, but again at a smaller type. Tau 2 is a smaller type than tau 1 hour tau 2. Right? That's why this definition is well-founded. That's what we mean. It's defined by induction on the structure of the type. Just by inspection, you can tell that it is a well-founded definition. Yes? But I think I'm using the Cock. That's the result. So uh, I get like a to get Yes. Logical relations encoding in Cock. Maybe, Adam, you and I should have, um, you know, done that. Maybe one of Adam's lectures should have been a how to do logical relations proofs in COG. <laughs> um, yes, that, that, the positivity condition is a problem. Um, we'll uh, really you have to. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, let's all right, so our relation is well-founded. Um, now, let's try to prove part A. Oh, this is going to be interesting. So when we try to prove part A, again, how do you think the proof is going to go? You're going to do the proof by induction on what? <laughs> hmm? Yeah, so we only have one premise, right? That E has type tau, we have a derivation, right? So we can just do induction on the derivation. So if we try to do this proof by induction on the derivation, let's look at what happens. We need to look at the typing rules because those are the cases we're going to consider, right? Okay. Remember that we are trying to prove this for a closed term. E is a closed term of type tau, and we are trying to do proof by induction on the structure of the derivation. So. All of the cases that we have to consider are up there. But imagine that all of those gammas in the conclusions of the rules are empty. Right? So all of those rules are fine. We won't have any problems until we hit lambda. If we are trying to prove this, if we're trying to do the case of the proof where we have um, lambda x colon tau dot e of some type, tau tau 2, we have no choice but to look at our premise, 
which add something to the environment. Okay? So we are not, when we, if we try to do um, the proof of, ah, part A, my board usage is off today. <laughs> um, we are going to run into trouble because here we can no longer, you know, when we try to appeal to our induction hypothesis, we no longer have an empty environment. So we can't do this proof directly, the proof of part A. We're going to have to do, to set up a more general statement of the theorem in order to, to carry out this proof. In particular, we're actually going to have to prove that something about open terms. So what, we, what can we prove about open terms? Um, all right, so E now has an arbitrary number of free variables, right? That's what I'm saying. I, I, we need to beef up our induction hypothesis so that we can push through our lambda case when we hit it. Um, but how do we even state the theorem for a term that's open? Yes? Um, for any substitution, S is like gamma that consists only of polynomial in terms. Very good. OK, OK. So we want to close off our term E. It has a bunch of free variables in it. So we need a substitution that gives us values um, that we can substitute for the free variables in E, all right? So let me, let me write gamma for a substitution, little gamma, all right? I'm going to assume that substitutions have the form, you know, x1 maps to v1 through xn maps to vn, right? So substitution is just a mapping from the variables in a in an type environment um, to values, right? This is a call by value language, so we have, we need, we want to substitute in um, values. All right, um, furthermore, I need some notation. So what I want to say is, well, first of all, I want all of these values to have the appropriate type according to gamma, right? Because this is my substitution that satisfies gamma in a sense. But I also want, so let me define this notation. I'm going to say, if you give me um, an expression that's well typed but has free variables in it, and you give me a substitution that satisfies my type environment ga gamma, and I'll tell you what that means in a second. Um, then, then I want to be able to prove the more generalized form of this. I want to be able to prove that after I close off that term with the substitution you just gave me, I have something that is strongly normalizing at the original type tau. OK, so let's think about that for a second. And let me define what I mean by this substitution satisfies uh, the gamma environment. OK, so it's exactly what the person whose name I do not know <laughs> just suggested. We want a substitution. So we want a whole bunch of values that we can pop in for these variables. But we want these values to themselves be strongly normalizing. Now. Why I want to do this has to do with what is going on in this function case, really. When I sub put in an argument, I mean, if you start the function case, right? I say, give me an argument. I will apply my function to that argument and get something strongly normalizing. But I require that the argument you give me is strongly normalizing. This gamma here is telling us about all of our free variables. The free variables of an expression are the little spots where all the inputs are going to come and sit, right? And what we need is for all of those inputs to have the property of interest to begin with. If they do, then I will show you that once you plop in the values, the inputs that you're interested in, which have the property of interest, you will get a whole program that has the property of interest. That's what's going on. OK? So that is exactly the statement of what this theorem is. You give me inputs that satisfy you know, my input type environment, you will get a closed program that is strongly normalizing. So, Let's just specify what we mean by our inputs must be, must have the property of interest. Well, um, so this says substitution for this environment. So we want to say that they have the same domains. The domain of little gamma must be equal to the domain of big gamma. Um, and we want to say that uh, for all x in the domain of either gamma, um, it must be the case that gamma x, which is these values that were substituted that we're providing as inputs has the strong normalization property at the appropriate type dictated by the type environment gamma, the type gamma x. Okay? All right. So 
again, all this is saying is give me a bunch of inputs of the right types according to the type environment, but just make sure that they all have the strong normalization property. All right, now let's back up for one second. What does it mean? Yes. Um, you could do include equals just makes it easier. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't, I don't think that would mess anything up. Include would be fine. Um, any other questions? Okay. Um, yes. So what I was about to ask you is why am I requiring that all of these values, what this is really saying is that each one of these values that are sitting in my substitution has to have the strong normalization property. So again, why am I doing that? Values are already values. They're already terminating. Why am I saying that they have to have the strong normalization property? Yeah, those values might be lambdas. That was exactly our problem to begin with, right? We need to say something strong about the lambdas, which means, in other words, we need to say something about the body of the lambdas. That when, when you apply the lambda to something, you're going to get something strongly normalized. OK, so um, all right, so how do we go about doing this proof? That's uh, the next thing. Any questions at this point? OK, um, before I go on, I'm just going to point out something minor that has to do with substitution. Um, uh, so we are going to prove this theorem now, right? We're going to prove it by induction on the structure of this typing derivation. But before we do that, I'm going to put down a couple of lemmas that we are going to need during that proof. OK, yeah. Sorry, what were it? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we, in this language, simply type lambda calculus, we have weakening, right? If you look at the variable rule up there, um, it says you can throw as many variables as you like into gamma. You can have x, y, and z, and x type checks, which means that I can keep throwing more and more variables into gamma, which are not necessary, right? So yes, you can certainly have the situation where those variables are not being used by the term, but that's fine. We require the property of them, yes. Um, uh, hmm. Perhaps. Um, yeah, I've never tried doing, you know, tracking which ones are necessary and which ones aren't. You could easily do that if you move to a linear type system, right? That would be the, the quick fix, and then everything will work out just fine. Uh, but I've never tried doing it explicitly, keeping track of which ones are necessary or not in, in such a language. Uh, should work, maybe. OK, um, now, lemmas of interest. Um, OK, so we need uh, these two lemmas. Um, so the first one says that um, if you have an E that is well typed under gamma, um, and you give me some substitution that satisfies big gamma, then, um, and this is just about typing, if I use the substitution to close off my program E, then I get something of type tau. This is almost trivial, right? I mean, because all it's saying is something about this substitution. If you stare at the definition of this substitution, we have required that every single value that we have in the substitution is of the right type. And that is being required right here, where we say gamma x, the value bound to x, has to be in the SN set, but with respect to the type big gamma x, right? It has to have the right type. That definition is going to require that each one of these values have the types that they should have as per the type environment. And then this is going to be a regular substitution lemma, just generalized to multiple variables. OK? Um, and if you want to see how that proof is carried out, um, you can look at uh, Benjamin Pierce's uh, types and programming languages, which goes into the details of how you would do a substitution proof, um, proof of a substitution lemma. Um, and it would just be by, OK. Um, now, um, we're going to need one other thing, which is um, a property about backward and forward substitutions. So we're going to need sorry, so 
We're going to need a lemma that says that strong normalization is preserved by forward, backward reduction. And this will make more sense when I write it out. Um, so basically, suppose that you have some E that is well typed, and E takes one step to some E prime. Okay? Then we want to have two properties. One is that uh, if E prime is strongly normalizing, then so is E. And the other is that if E is strongly normalizing, then so is E prime. OK? Intuitively, they make sense, right? I'm here. I take another step. If I, was, if I know that this E is strongly normalizing, then clearly it's 1 and 2. And vice versa. I'm here. I know I'm strongly normalizing. That means that one expression earlier than that must be strongly normalizing. Right? OK. So um, I'll leave the proof of this lemma as an exercise. Um, and it's something that you know, would be useful for you guys to try out this afternoon, for instance. OK. Uh, now. Let's um, go ahead and try to do, try to prove A, or sorry, not prove A, but prove this, this theorem, the, the strong normalization theorem. Um, OK, actually, before I go on, so I said that in order to prove A, we have to prove this more general form. Um, I hope it's clear to everyone that once we have proved this theorem, the theorem that we actually wanted will simply follow as a corollary, right? Because the only difference is the, the environment is empty here, right? It's just that we couldn't get our proof to go through with an empty environment. So that's why we have to do this for a stronger induction hypothesis. All right. Um, so how do we do this proof? <laughs> proof of our strong normalization theorem. By induction on the structure of this typing derivation. All right. So we have a bunch of cases to consider. Uh, which, let me show you those. Let's start with, uh, let's start with the easiest thing. Let's start with true. All right. Uh, I'm going to put my theorem here. I've messed up my board usage. Okay, the theorem that we are proving is or maybe I'll just move it up. I'll hold up. Let's see how this works. Bear with me. No, it's still gone. That's the theorem we're proving. Let's put it up here. OK. Hopefully that will work better. All right. So let's do true. So we know that true has type bool under gamma. And we're saying that we, our premise tells us that we have a substitution that satisfies gamma. Okay? And what we are required to show is that gamma applied to true is strongly normalizing at the type bool. Right? Okay. So what should we, let's look. Um, the first thing we should do is let's note that true doesn't have any free variables. So applying the substitution to it is useless, right? So um, it suffices to show that true is strongly normalizing. Because gamma applied to true is the same as true. All right, so this is what we have to show. Uh, here's our definition. We have to show that true is in this set. So that means we have to show that true has type bool under the empty context, which it does. Right? OK. Second, we have to show that true terminates. It does because it's a value. Right? OK, so that was really easy, wasn't it? We're done. <laughs> all right. Next case. <laughs> if only they were all that easy. Um, uh, let's do variables before we do anything harder. So. Under gamma, x has type tau, and we know that 
scale on that x to tau. All right, so again, um, we have a substitution that satisfies gamma. So all of our inputs have the strong normalization property. And what we are required to show is that gamma applied to our term x is strongly normalizing at this type tau, where this tau is exactly gamma x, right? OK. So how do we proceed now? This is an arbitrary type. So we can't do what we did before, right? We had Boole sitting there. We just went and looked at the definition, said, hey, what do we need to prove, and proved it. Now we just have an arbitrary type there, so we can't do that. Um, so we need to, to look at our term. Wait, where's our term coming from? Gamma, the substitution, gamma, right? OK, so what do we know about gamma? Right, that all the values in it are strongly normalizing, right? Our definition tells us that um, whenever you have a substitution that satisfies a big gamma, their domains are the same. So that x, since x is in big gamma, we know that it's in little gamma, right? And second, we know that gamma x is strongly normalizing at the right type. This tau is just gamma x, and that's exactly the property that we get out of here. Right? So we're done again. Again, we're done by an assumption because we, we built the definition to say, you have to give me good inputs. Right? And then when I take that good input and I plop it into my program, I get a good program. OK. Um, where good means strongly normalizing in that sentence. OK. Uh, now, uh, we've done two easy cases. Let's try and do, um, let's try a new application next. All right? I'll leave if then else to you as an exercise. And you'll be able to do it after you've seen application. OK. Now, some of you may be wondering why I'm doing application first and not lambda first. because application is easier. <laughs> That's going to be funny. Um, so because of the way that we have strengthened our induction hypothesis by defining this logical relation, it's going to turn out that application will be easier and lambda will be harder. OK, we'll see why in a minute. All right, so we want to do the application case. Again, we already know, or we have by our premise, a substitution that satisfies big gamma. And what we want to show is that the application is strongly normalizing after we've closed it off. So we want to show that gamma applied to E1, E2 is strongly normalizing at its type tau. Right? OK. So again, let me do the exercise from last time. As in, let's push this substitution in. Let's do something about the substitution. All right. And let's note that this, should, proving um, that that application is strongly normalizing is the same as proving that gamma 1 applied to, gamma applied to E1 and ga applied to, yeah, gamma E1, gamma E2 is strongly normalizing, right? We're just going to push the substitution in. So that's what we want to prove. Now, logical relations proofs are all about sort of looking at where you are, what, what are the things that you have, right? And then trying to sort of unroll, you know, look, look at what the induction hypotheses give you and match that up with what the definition either asks or gives you, right? Um, the proofs normally go, the proofs could almost be boring if the definitions are right. And that's the way it should be. Getting those definitions right so that the proof actually goes through, that's the real challenge. Logical relations are like this little puzzle, all right? You, you, set, you require something a little stronger in one place in the definition, which means, hey, good, now you have something stronger, so it's going to make one case easier. Maybe the alim form, as in this case, but that means it's going to make the other, the dual of that, the intro form, harder, or vice versa. That always happens, OK? All right. Um, they're like this little puzzle where you're trying to get things just right. Um, sorry? 
Oh, when I had pushed the gammas in, yes, I was using properties of substitution. Not that particular substitution lemma. I, I was playing kind of fast and loose, but um, you can do this proof more formally, right? Um, that uh, by reasoning about exact, you know, what's it? By induction. Essentially, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so that's what we want to show. Uh, what do we have from our induction hypotheses? Okay, wait, so you're saying by the induction hypothesis, by anything, what? Uh, any, anything, um, any expression of type uh, tau one, tau tau? Yeah. Or, uh, of type tau two. Or tau? Okay, okay, let's, let's just write down the, the two statements that we have from the two premises that we have, right? Um, by Applying our induction hypothesis to the E1 premise and the E2 premise, we're going to get two facts. And we're going to need to use those two facts, right? OK, what are those facts? Let me just really write it out. They're, they're going to be facts of this form, right? We're going to get that if E1, ha which has type uh, tau 2 arrow tau, um, if you have that, which we do, and you have a good substitution, which we do, a substitution that satisfies gamma, then that E1, after you close it off, is going to be strongly normalizing, right? So by applying the induction hypothesis to the first premise, we get that, we get this conclusion, right? We're plugging in our nice substitution to get that gamma of E1 is strongly normalizing at its type tau 2 arrow tau. Tau 2 arrow tau. Right? Okay, similarly, by applying the induction hypothesis to the second premise, we get a similar statement, gamma applied to E2 is strongly normalizing. This time at which type? Tau 2, which is its type. Right? The type comes from right there. All right. Um, so we have those two things. But we want to prove that there, the application of this term to this term is strongly normalizing. <coughs> OK. Yes, there. Someone pointed there. Here, the definition. OK, so what do we know about E1? It's strongly normalizing at the type tau 2 arrow tau. Let's look at what that gives us. Here's the strong normalization definition for functions. It tells us well-typed, terminating, and some third magic condition about a limb form. We're doing an a limb form application. This is why we built this condition in. So let's use it. All right, we're going to try to use this condition. So what does this condition says? It says that if you give me an argument that is strongly normalizing at the argument type, then you get an application that's strongly normalizing. Can we? Oh, fortunately, we have an argument that is strongly normalizing at the correct argument type. So we're going to take this part, right, from, from this fact here, we get this entire third statement. We instantiate the E prime with our argument, gamma E2, which is strongly normalizing. And as a result, we get that gamma E1 applied to the argument that we just plugged in for E prime in that definition, gamma E2, is strongly normalizing at the result type, which here happens to be this tau. What did we want to prove? Yes. <laughs> right. OK. So it just fell out from the definition, because we were clever enough to put, make, you know, make the definition that way. OK. So that's what I meant by application becomes easy, because we built the definition so that it has this third condition in it, which tells us something about application working out easily. Assuming that you can pass in an argument that has the right property, which is what this is requiring. OK. Now, um, lambda is harder, of course. Let's do lambda. Can I erase this? Or I can proceed on other boards. Good? No one taking notes? Good? All right. All right, done taking notes. Um, so <coughs> lambda. All right. Lambda. 
All right. Again, we start off by saying um, we know that we have a lambda term that's well typed, and we have that we have a substitution that satisfies gamma. And we have to show that gamma applied to lambda x colon tau dot e, sorry, tau 1 dot e, uh, is strongly normalizing at its function type tau 1 arrow tau 2. OK? Now I am again going to do my usual trick of pushing the substitution in. So it suffices to show this equivalent statement that lambda x colon tau 2 dot gamma e is strongly normalizing. Right? Gamma contains substitutions for the variables. This type doesn't have any variable. So we can just push the substitution into the body and, and get something equivalent. All right. So that's what we have to show. Um, now, uh, let's see what our induction hypothesis gives us. Because I don't really know how else to proceed. Right? OK. So let's see. It tells us, I want to write out the full statement, right? Um, here's the statement. Um, induction hypothesis is that if you have gamma x colon tau 1 e tau, and you have a substitution, I'm going to call it gamma prime, that satisfies this environment. It's extended right now, right? Then you may use this fact, Sn uh, tau gamma prime E. That is the induction hypothesis. And we have to see if we can use it. So we clearly already have a term um, of the right type. But here, we are being asked to cough up some substitution gamma prime that satisfies not just gamma, but gamma extended with x colon tau 1. So what gamma prime might we use? Hmm. Let's pause for a minute. <laughs> Let's leave that statement up on the board, all right? And look at what we're trying to prove. What are we trying to prove? We're trying to prove that this lambda is in Sn tau 1 hour tau 2. Oh, wait, so let's go look at the definition. We have to show three things. We have to show that the lambda, lambda x dot gamma e, has the right type. OK? So we have to show three things. One is that lambda x colon tau 2 dot gamma e uh, has is closed and has the right type, which is tau 1 arrow tau 2. Does it? Well, we can prove that it does simply by using the substitution lemma that I put up here. That gamma that we're using there does satisfy our type environment big gamma. And therefore, when we close off the term, we should get something of type tau. That's exactly what I just used. So by that substitution lemma, we, we get that this lambda is well typed. OK, so that was fact one. Fact two that we're required to prove is that the lambda terminates. OK. Um, are you thinking here? Ah, hold on, hold on. Um, leave this statement off to the side. Uh, but, but right now I'm talking about this lambda where the uh, x is not free. That, that's why, yeah. Maybe I shouldn't have put this up on the board. Just stop. Ah, OK, in terms of literally applying that fact. OK, yes, you're right. Literally, I should be applying it to this one right here. Does everyone see that? If you match it up with the substitution lemma, the substitution lemma tells me that gamma applied to this lambda is well typed. And then I have to say that I can push the gamma in. I'm playing a little fast and loose with substitution here, especially with the pushing in part. Oh, OK. All right. So. Perhaps, I mean, I could rephrase this very easily by saying 
that by the substitution lemma, we really have this fact, right? And then I can push. Therefore, I know that when I push my gamma in, that must be well typed. And here I'm hand waving. Okay? All right. Part two. Uh, we need to show that this lambda terminates, but it's already a value. So we're good, right? So we needed to prove that lambda x colon tau 2 dot gamma e terminates. It's already a value, so we're good. Tau 2? Uh, I've written it as tau, oh, you're right. I messed that up. It's a tau 1. This is a tau 1. At some point, I changed the 1 to a 2. Sorry about that. So this is a 1. Let's fix them all. This is a 1. Uh, this is a 1. And this is a 1. Thank you for that. E. Here. Here? Thank you. I think I switched them from the app case to this case. There I, I had written the function type as tau2 arrow tau and was continuing to do that. All right. OK, so um, I hope that's good now. All right, so number three, the third property that we have to prove. This is the really interesting one, right? So we have to prove this now about um, in order to show that the lambda belongs to the set Sn at the appropriate type. OK, so how are we going to do that? Um, well, in order to prove this fact, uh, we're going to say, let's start by supposing that we have some argument, E prime, that has a strong normalization property. So suppose we have um, suppose we have E prime such that strongly normalizing E prime at the argument type tau 1. OK? And now what we have to show is this fact right here, that the application is strongly normalizing at the result type tau 2. And what is the application? Let me put that here. Show that our lambda, lambda x colon tau 1 dot gamma e applied to um, this argument, e prime, is strongly normalizing at the result type tau 2. That's what we have to show. OK? All right. Now, at this point, we're talking about application. We're talking about you know, application, which is essentially going to take this e prime. Well, how is this going to run? I mean, first we're going to run e prime, right, down to some sort of value. Let's call it v prime. If, I'm just trying to imagine the operational semantics in action, right? It's called by value, so e prime's first going to evaluate to some v prime. That v prime gets plugged into the lambda. And then we end up sort of somewhere wanting to reason about the fact that this gamma e with e, you know, that v prime substituted for x terminates. That's reminiscent of exactly where we got stuck before, the first time we tried to do the proof in a naive fashion, right? OK, so um, what's going to save us now? Well. Let's see. We have this unused induction hypothesis sitting up there. And what's missing? We need a substitution gamma prime that satisfies the extended environment. We already have gamma that satisfies big gamma. But we need a gamma prime that satisfies the extended environment. And what does that mean? It means that we're going to have to take gamma and extend it with a mapping from x to something such that, such that this condition is satisfied. The x that we add has to be strongly normalizing, such that whatever this v question mark is, it has the strong normalization property at the required type, tau 1. Can you give me a v prime that has that property? Sorry, I'm asking you to think at 3.30 after lunch. This is like <laughs> Evaluate the E prime, exactly. Right. So um, if you 
run E prime. Remember we have this lemma right here. We know that that E prime uh, is strongly normalizing at tau one, right? We just said that. We said, suppose we have an E prime that is strongly normalizing at tau one, okay? Um, e prime that is strongly normalizing at tau one. That means that when we run it, sorry, I'm, I want to use this one, forward reduction. Um, that means that with every single step E prime takes, whatever expression we get is going to remain strongly normalizing until we get to some V prime, that's going to be strongly normalizing, right? And plus, how do I know I can ever get to a V prime? It's strongly normalizing. Right? We proved that at the very beginning. We, we said, um, if something is in the set Sn, then it terminates. So we know that this E prime will terminate, right? So from this property, we get that E prime will terminate. And we're going to call that value V prime. We know it exists. Now we use our forward, um, you know, Sn is preserved by forward reduction lemma uh, to prove that by multiple applications, that V prime is strongly normalizing at the same type, which is tau one. Yeah? Okay, so we have that fact. Now since we have a V prime that's strongly normalizing at tau one, we seem to need a V question mark that is strongly normalizing at tau one. Let's use our V prime. Okay? So what I'm saying is we're going to use this induction hypothesis. It's asking for an argument of type tau one that is strongly normalizing. We have one in our hands. So we're, we're going to say, OK, by this induction hypothesis, uh, picking gamma prime to be this extended substitution, we know that this extended substitution uh, satisfies V prime satisfies gamma uh, x colon tau 1. So we're good. Um, then what we get is strongly normalizing. Read it off for me. What are we getting? What was the body? E is the body of the lambda, right? So what we're getting is strongly normalizing. Oh, there's an error here too. This should be tau two. Okay, strongly normalizing at the type tau two. Uh, gamma prime, which is now x, maps to v prime applied to E. I'm doing a bunch of pattern matching, right? Okay, if you take your extended substitution and apply it to the E that we were talking about to begin with, you know that that closed thing is strongly normalizing at the results type. What did we want to prove? That lambda applied to that. What is lambda applied to that? Notice that lambda x colon tau 1 dot gamma e applied to e2, sorry, applied to e prime, goes in a bunch of steps to lambda x tau 1 dot gamma e applied to v prime, right? We already talked about that. Okay, and then we're going to do beta reduction, so we end up with that applied to v prime. Sorry, lambda that applied to v prime. I should write that as beta reduction. So v prime for x. Sorry about that. OK, so now um, we want, we have this fact. And what we, what we know it would suffice to prove is that this term is strongly normalizing at the type tau 2, right? Because we needed to prove that this is strongly normalizing, but we, we did a whole bunch of forward reduction and got to some term, and now we want that to be strongly normalizing, right? OK, so we can just munge this. This term and this term are, are identical, because you can just rewrite this to actually go ahead and do the substitution um, of v for x and e, and you end up with that, right? OK, so therefore, strongly normalizing at the type tau 2, uh, gamma with um, sorry, gamma applied to E with V for prime for X. Sorry, that is too low for many people to see, I think. Um, but, you know, and again, I'm playing a little bit uh, fast and loose with the substitutions. But they both basically match up. But what did we do 
in that rather long proof. Oh, I should stop. Um, let me just say one, one or two sentences about it. Basically, it came down to what was sitting up here, this induction hypothesis. The induction hypothesis was about an extended environment. Right? It said, you have to give me something of type tau 1 that is strongly normalizing. Fortunately, the property that we were trying to prove about lambda asks us to suppose that we have an argument that is strongly normalizing. So it is exactly that that we go and stick in, in here, or rather in here, in the substitution, and things fit together and fall out, so to speak. OK? All right. Um, so as an exercise, I would like you to really go through this proof one more time, slowly and quietly, <laughs> um, yourself. Because I think that that's really the thing that, you know, once you're staring at a bunch of logical relations definitions, you unwind them yourself and you figure out what the order of the steps is, that's when it really kind of starts to make sense to you. Um, so, uh, and, and for those who want to do something more, um, I would um, I'd say a good exercise would be to extend this proof with pairs, right? So add one more type to your language, type for pairs. Um, so you're adding a pair introduction form and um, first and second to your language, and then carry out the proof and prove that it uh, is also strong normaliz strongly normalizing. And see how conditions one, two, and three that we put down on the board play out in the clause that you add for SN for pairs. Okay? Do you need condition three like we needed it for functions? Notice we never added anything analogous to condition three for booleans, and everything still worked out. Do you need it for pairs? All right. Um, I'm going to stop there.